The committee will come to order. I note that a quorum is present. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. Without objection, members of the full committee not on this subcommittee are authorized to participate in today's hearing. The committee is meeting today pursuant to notice to hear testimony on diversity asset managers, challenges, solutions, and opportunity for inclusion. I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. Thank you everyone for joining us for this hearing entitled Diverse Asset Managers, Challenges, Solutions, and Opportunity for Inclusion. This hearing addresses an often overlooked problem in the investment sector, the stark lack of diversity money managers in the vast $71 trillion asset management industry. While affluence continues to accumulate for many, access opportunity remains unattainable for an entire group of financial professionals left out of the system. In fact, according to a report by Harvard Business School and Bella Research Group entitled Diversifying Investments, majority diverse owned firms represent less than 1% of assets under management across four asset classes, mutual funds, hedge funds, private equity, and real estate. Yet empirical research shows that there is no statistical difference in performance between diverse owned firms, their peers, even when adjusted for risk and compared to public market returns. Today's hearing seeks to highlight solutions and opportunities for greater inclusion to increase the participation of minority and women owned firms in the asset management industry. This topic also seeks to address the fallacy that diversity-owned firms are low return social investments. We need to look closer into this mischaracterization, characterization, which oftentimes leaves diverse firms underutilized by institutional investors. According to an analysis by Morningstar Inc., only 2% of the assets in the ever-growing 12 trillion US open in mutual fund universe were managed exclusively by women and just 2.5% of the funds had a woman as a sole manager. Women are also less likely to manage active funds and more likely to run funds of funds which own other funds rather than individual securities. In this case, diversity is present, but inclusion is still a far reality. Unfortunately, wealth is still concentrated in the hands of a few financial entities and very little opportunity to diverse own firms. If the criteria established to enter the market and succeed in this industry is devised arbitrarily, only a handful of firms will be able to participate. It is also important to remember that so much of the asset management is relation-driven. This country is serious about closing the ever-widening wealth gap, and I am proud to have today's hearing to help establish new solutions for addressing the challenges of asset managers. I reserve the balance of my time for the Chair of the Financial Services Committee, Chairwoman Waters. The Chair now recognizes the ranking member for four minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this hearing today to address the underrepresentation of women and minority-owned firms in the asset management industry. Asset management is one of the country's most profitable industries, with over $100 billion in profits annually. Despite massive growth in this sector, women and minorities are underrepresented. The underrepresentation of minority and women-owned asset management firms is a trend across all major asset categories, including mutual fund management, hedge fund ownership, and private equity management. In 2016, only 1.1% of the $74 trillion in U.S. <laughs> assets were managed by minority and, mi and women-owned firms. By 2018, that number had slightly increased to 1.3%. We can and should do better. We know that on average, firms with diverse managers or owners have equal 
or better returns compared to their less diverse competitors. A 2017 GAO study found minority and women-owned asset managers face various challenges when competing for investment management opportunities with institutional investors, including retirement plans and foundation. Specifically, GAO found such firms must overcome investor and consultant brand bias, perception of weaker performance, and a lack of infrastructure. The GAO report identified four ways to increase access to funds for minority and women-owned firms. Leadership commitment, removal of potential barriers, outreach to women and minority-owned firms, and clear communication about priorities and expectations to increase diversity. We have seen large firms in the industry demonstrating their commitment to initiatives that focus on finding women and minority managers, such as the Emerging Managers Program, which has proven to be very successful. Additionally, large firms have assigned assets to smaller women and minority-led funds. But this issue goes beyond lack of access to funds. Diversifying the talent pool is also key to diversifying the asset management industry. The lack of female and minority students enrolled in STEM programs at the high school and university level has led to a, a pipeline problem that creates major barriers to increasing diversity among asset managers. Programs to increase participation in STEM disciplines are critical to fostering meaningful diversification of the industry. Meredith Jones, who is testifying today, is an alternative investment consultant and author of Women of the Street, Why Female Money Managers Generate Higher Returns. Ms. Jones has written numerous articles on diverse asset managers, including a, a Rothenstein Cass Institute study entitled Women in Alternative Investments, a marathon, not a split sprint. They include things like educating investors on the benefits of diverse asset managers, educating firms on how the diversity dividend can better directly impact their bottom line, providing financial investment literacy education to girls and people of color uh, at a young, young age. Um, like all firms, minority and, and women-owned firms should have an equal opportunity to manage funds for institutional investors. Today's hearing should focus on discussing strategies that have proven successful for removing those barriers and leveling the playing field. I thank our witnesses for being here, and I look forward to discussing the key practices, and I reserve the balance of my time. The chair, chair now recognizes the ranking member of the Financial Services Committee, the Honorable Patrick McHenry, for one minute. Well, thank you, Chairwoman Beatty, and uh, thank you and Ranking Member Wagner for your commitment uh, to this very important uh, discussion on diversity and inclusion. Uh, like all industries, when it comes to the asset management industry, everyone who participates deserves an equal playing field. But the statistics suggest that for minority and women-owned firms, that is not the case. In 2016, only 1.1% of the $74 trillion in U.S. assets were managed by minority and women-owned firms. Uh, by 2018, that number had, had risen slightly uh, to 1.3%. Significant dollar figures, but not significant in percentage. We need to identify the obstacles that are causing women and minorities to be underrepresented in this key industry and figure out strategies to address them. So I think this hearing is an important one. I look forward to hearing the testimony from our witnesses um, and the broader discussion outside of this jurisdiction of this committee on how we can actually further diversity and inclusion uh, in a comprehensive way. And I yield back. I am very pleased to announce that we have a couple special guests in the audience today. I'm pleased to acknowledge Skip Spriggs III, President and CEO of the Executive Leadership Council, and joined with him Libby Rice. I am also very pleased to acknowledge Ronald Reeves, the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer from AIG, who is in attendance in this hearing today, both experts in this field. Ron leads the extraordinary efforts of fostering the culture of inclusion at AIG, which has been successful in attracting and retaining talent. Today, first I'd like to thank the witnesses for being here, and we welcome the testimony of a very diverse and distinguished panel of witnesses. I'd like to welcome the testimony of Juan Martinez, Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, 
Mr. Martinez is responsible for the foundation's financial management, reporting and regulatory compliance, overseeing the management of his $2.4 billion investment portfolio and partnering with the program staff in development of grants and programs related investment. He is an alumni of Florida International University, Miami-Dade College, and the Wharton School of Business. Next, we welcome the testimony of John Rogers, Jr., Chairman, CEO, and Chief Investment Officer of Aerial Investments. He is a member of the Board of Directors of McDonald's, Nike, the New York Times Company, and serve as, serves as Vice Chair of the Board of Trustees of the University of Chicago. He served as the co-chair for the Presidential Inaugural Committee in 2009, and more recently, he joined the Barack Obama Foundation's Board of Directors. He is also the founder of Aerial Community Academy, which works throughout the Chicago community to provide world-class educational opportunities with a focus on financial literacy, and I thank you for that. In 2008, John was awarded the Princeton University's highest honor, the Woodrow Wilson Award, presented each year to an alumni whose career embodies the commitment to national services. Next, we welcome the testimony of Brenda Chia, founding board member and co-chair, Associations of Asian Americans Investment Managers, AAAIM, from 2007 until 2012, Brenda was the first president of the Association of Asian American Investment Managers, an organization that brings together institutional capital and qualified Asian American investors across major asset classes to conduct business and build alliances. She holds a bachelor's of science in degree in computer sciences and an MBA from Harvard Business School. And Brenda, it is nice to see you again, and thank you for attending our members' roundtable June the 4th and providing insight into the challenges within the industry. Next, we welcome the testimony of Angela Miller May, Chief Investment Officer of the Chicago Teachers Pension Fund. Angela Miller May directs $10 billion pension fund that services a membership over 63,000 and retired Chicago public school teachers. She earned a BA in economics from Northwestern University and holds an MBA in accounting from DePaul University. And finally, we welcome the testimony of Ms. Meredith Jones, an alternative investment consultant and author whose research focuses on emerging managers. Until the acquisition of Rothstein Cass, by KPMG, Meredith served as director of the Rothstein Cass Institute, an alternative investment think tank. At the institute, she created the first Women in Alternative Investment Hedge Fund Index to measure performances of female hedge fund and provide equity managers. The witnesses will be reminded their, their oral testimony will be limited to five minutes. Without objection, your written testimony will be part of the record. The witnesses are reminded to, re to turn on their microphones and abide by the three lights in front of you. Green means go, yellow means wrap it up, and red means stop. Thank you for indulging me. I've had swollen vocal cords for five days, and it is getting better. Mr. Martinez, you are now recognized for five minutes to give oral presentation of your testimony. Um, Madam Chairwoman, uh, Chairwoman uh, Ranking Member and Members, thank you for the opportunity to testify about Knight Foundation's experience and the research Knight has sponsored on the state of ownership diversity in the investment management industry. First, let me provide a little background on Knight Foundation for context. The John S. and James L. Knight Foundation supports informed and engaged communities through its funding of charitable programs in 26 U.S. communities, the arts, and journalism. Since its inception in 1950, Knight has spent $2.5 billion on its important mission. 
an average of 6.1% of assets annually. That spending is funded from our endowment. Because of our investing, Knight has also been able to grow our endowment from the original $660 million contributed by the Knights and their mother, Clara, to $2.3 billion, meaning that our impact will be able to continue into the future. So how Knight invests is vital to us. We believed that the results demonstrated we'd done a good job, except when it came to diversity. We assumed that because diversity adds value and we'd done well, our investment program must contain it. We were wrong. When we, at, when we were asked in 2010 how much of our portfolio was invested by minority and women-owned firms, we found that only $7.5 million were being managed by one African-American-owned firm. That was, to say the least, a surprise. With the support of our board of trustees, we became intentional in searching out opportunities to invest with women in diverse-owned firms. Today, about 34% of our, um, or $749 million of our endowment is being managed by 14 women or diverse-owned firms. And that portfolio is meeting our return expectations. As our investments with diverse firms grew, we heard that Knight was unique. Uh, as a foundation built on the values of fact-based journalism and its positive impacts on communities, we saw the need for solid research and objective facts to inform the discussion. We engaged Bella Private Markets, led by recognized industry experts, Dr. Josh Lerner from Harvard Business School and Ann Lehman, to conduct a rigorous study on the state of diversity in the investment industry. And to ensure that their work was based on the highest quality data available, Bella used several leading commercial data providers already used in academic research. Among the study's major findings were that women in diverse-owned firms managed a very small percentage, about 1.3% of assets managed by US-based firms, with their median fund size typically smaller than non-diverse peers. Bella found no statistical differences in investment performance either, and certain investors, like public funds, represent a disproportionately larger percentage of the investments in diverse-owned funds. Because the question of potential differences in investment performance is so important, Bella examined it in two ways, by performing a variety of statistical analyses and by examining the distribution of investment performance. They found no statistical evidence that women or minority ownership negatively, negatively Im impacts performance and that women and diverse owned firms were overrepresented in the top quartile investment performance for all funds. This contradicts the long held belief that investing with min women and, minor and diverse owned firms results in lower returns. Bella's research also found that the penalty for underperformance is larger for diverse owned managers. Certainly, these studies provide new insights and raise new questions for future research, but the reports highlight the difficulty in obtaining data on ownership and investing diversity in the industry as an impediment for future research. Knight and a growing number of other investors see an investment opportunity here. We hope that the continuing research spurs others to join us and to pursue this conversation further. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you. Mr. John Rogers, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Chairwoman Beatty, Ranking Member Wagner, Chairwoman Waters, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to speak with you. I would also like to thank the excellent staff for their thoughtful work. My name is John Rogers. I'm the chairman and CEO of Chicago-based Ariel Investments, founded in 1983, the first African-American-owned asset management firm in the country. I am the product of two pioneering parents. My father was an original Tuskegee Airman, and my mom was the first African-American woman to graduate from the University of Chicago Law School in 1946. Fast forward to today. The economic prospects of the black community have stalled or even gone backwards. For example, Ray Bashar of the St. Louis Fed reports that between 1992 
and 2016, college-educated whites saw their wealth soar 96%, while college-educated blacks saw theirs fall 10%. We are here to, discuss, here to discuss asset management, one of the largest sources of wealth, power, and jobs in today's economy. Of the wealthiest Americans on the Forbes 400 list, over 30% generated their wealth in financial services or real estate. The top three private equity firms control over two million jobs. Asset management offers a stark reminder of the obstacles preventing people of color from fully partici participating in our capitalist democracy. Your committee oversees the country's largest banks. The four largest hire hundreds of asset management firms to invest nearly $1 trillion across three distinct pools of assets their own corporate pension plans, their own 401k plans, and externally managed wealth management platforms. You can essentially round down to zero the assets, man the assets managed by diverse firms across these three buckets. But there's no shortage of high-performing diverse-owned firms. For example, Vista Equity Partners is one of the best-performing private equity funds in recent years. Brown Capital was named Morningstar Manager of the Year in 2015. And our aerial fund is the top performing fund in its category since the financial crisis ended. Yet when compared to the largest asset management firms, we are all essentially rounding errors. Vista, the largest black-owned private equity firm, according to Black Enterprise, is less than 1% the size of BlackRock, which manages over $6.5 trillion. As Reverend Jackson often says, baseball became a better sport when Jackie Robinson was allowed to play. The financial services industry is well served by dynamic leaders such as Eddie Brown, Melody Hobson, Gilbert Garcia, and Robert Smith. These folks are job creators, philanthropists, and vitally important role models in our community. Recently, of course, we all saw Robert commit to erase the student loan debt of the entire 2019 graduating class of Morehouse College. I offer three thoughts on why barriers persist in the asset management industry. First, there's a tendency to work with people you know, grew up with, and with whom you are comfortable. Second, due to implicit or unconscious bias, many do not think of black and brown leaders as top performing money managers. Third, many banks, corporations, and nonprofits have embraced well-intentioned supplier diversity programs, emphasizing construction, catering, janitorial services, and other commodity-related fields. However, this approach too often excludes us from the parts of the economy where the actual wealth, power, and jobs are created today. I would go as far as calling it a modern-day Jim Crow. I would recommend directing institutions under the purview of this committee to implement three solutions. First, I support the proposed legislation creating a Rooney Rule for banks and other entities. Second, measure all spending by specific category, including asset management and professional services, and replace the term supplier diversity with business diversity. Third, CEOs and their management teams can be held accountable by this committee for providing meaningful transparency and making measurable progress year by year. In closing, tackling economic inequality through business opportunity is more important than ever. As Dr. King predicted, African Americans could only be liberated from the crushing weight of poor education, squalid housing, and economic strangulation by being integrated with power into every level of American life. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Chia, you will now be recognized for five minutes to present your oral presentation of your testimony. Chairwoman Beatty, Ranking Member Wagner, Chairwoman Waters, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the experience of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the investment industry. I am Brenda Chia, a founding board member and current board co-chair of the Association of Asian American Investment Managers. That's a mouthful, so we acronym it to AIM. <laughs> the organization was founded in 2006 as a national nonprofit dedicated to the, to the advancement of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, also known as AAPIs, in the field of investment management. AIM provides a platform pro for professionals in the industry to meet, network, and create business opportunities. We deliver our work through educational events, 
face-to-face -face and online networking, and advocating for the AAPI community through opportunities such as this hearing. The current network comprises over 3,000 institutional investors and fund managers. I would like to highlight a specific challenge faced by AAPIs, which is the model minority stereotype. It is broadly defined as the perception that AAPIs are successful and do not need help in any field. AAPIs are 5.6% of this country's population, but as, as you have heard, minority and women-owned firms manage around 1% of assets in the aggregate. Clearly, the model minority stereotype does not hold here. It is not about enriching specific investment managers. It is about the impact on our community. Studies have shown that minority and women-led firms invest in more diverse entrepreneurs and businesses. We'd look outside the box for opportunities. This in turn benefits our communities and creates more jobs without sacrificing the returns that institutional investors need to meet their funding obligations. The investment business is one that thrives on scale. The startup costs and fixed costs associated with smaller firms are such that they do not generate impact until they reach threshold asset sizes, which varies by asset class. For example, a public equity fund that manages a billion dollars may generate around $5 million in annual fees. This may sound significant, but the costs of running a small fund are high due to compliance, salaries for qualified staff, and client service. Therefore, to impact one's community, total fund size needs to be an order of magnitude larger. Without broader access to capital, minority and women-led funds continue to be marginalized because their assets are restricted. Several large state pension funds have come to the conclusion that they need to create a farm system by which they can invest with smaller firms, many of which also happen to be ethnically and gender diverse. This creates an environment where the small firms today could become the next generation of successful firms with trillions of dollars under management. Taking this one step further, in order to achieve a level playing field, we propose that minority and women managers not be limited to set aside allocations where we compete against each other for a small slice of the pie. We would like to compete for the whole pie. AIM stands ready for AAPIs to have open and fair access. Congress can play a critical role in this. While you cannot legislate quotas or mandate criteria selection, Congress can create opportunity. The federal government has trillions of dollars of pension funds and other capital under management. Congress could mandate that funds under federal management be subject to regular and periodic open competition. Congress could also recommend that federal agencies ensure that qualified minority and women-led funds are considered as part of any RFP evaluation process. We urge Congress to consider adopting a Rooney Rule for the investment industry. By creating opportunities, Congress can take some small steps towards ensuring a more diverse pool of fund managers. It would be a meaningful step towards opening doors and creating greater transparency. Thank you for your leadership on this issue of diversity and, and inclusion, Chairman Beatty, and thank you to all committee members. Thank you. Ms. Miller-May, you are recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation on your testimony. Chairwoman Beatty, Ranking Member Wagner, Chairwoman Waters, and members of the subcommittee, I am honored to be here today and I thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Angela Miller-May and I am the Chief Investment Officer for Chicago Teachers Pension Fund. I would like to recognize our Board of Trustee President, Mr. Jeffrey Blackwell, remaining trustees, and our Executive Director, Mr. Charles A. Burbridge, who support and drive the diversity and inclusion goals and the culture of Chicago Teachers Pension Fund. CTPF services a membership base of over 66,000 members. It is important to our members that we demonstrate diversity by hiring asset managers, brokers, and vendors that reflect the diversity of the membership. In my testimony, I will demonstrate how Chicago Teachers Pension Fund embraces diversity and inclusion. CTPF is a $10.8 billion fund and remains at the forefront of pension and retirement systems throughout the U.S. 
ensuring that investment firms owned by minorities, women, and persons with disabilities have access to the many opportunities to conduct business with CTPF. Per Illinois Pension Code, an aspirational goal of not less than 20% of investment advisors shall be minorities, women, and persons with disabilities. We have far exceeded that goal by investing 44% or 4.6 billion of total assets with minority women and persons with disability-owned firms as of March 31, 2019. Of the 44%, 58.2% is invested with women-owned firms. 25.3% is invested with African-American-owned firms. 12% is invested with Latino-owned firms. 3.3% is invested with Asian-American-owned firms. 0.6% is invested with persons with disability-owned firms. And 0.3% is invested with multiple and minority-owned firms. From our, from from an asset class standpoint, CTPF has exceeded its diversity policy goals in the equities, fixed income, and alternative spaces. Our policies are simply guidelines that establish minimum targets. It is a part of our fiduciary duty to invest the fund's assets in a prudent manner, and investing with diverse asset managers that demonstrate outperformance and deliver strong returns is more than prudent, it is wise. Having diverse managers in your portfolio brings diverse thoughts, improved decision making, and solutions in a current market environment that is challenged. Diverse managers perform the same, if not better, than non-diverse managers. They are a key source of diversification as they complement large managers that seek larger assets and deals. There is room for all. As a prudent investor, it does not make sense to not take advantage of the unique opportunity that investing with diverse managers present. As an underfunded pension fund, we simply cannot afford to forego investing with diverse managers. Diverse managers exhibit strong returns, but they are dramatically underrepresented in every asset class. They face many challenges, such as investor and consultant brand bias perception of weaker performance, size and infrastructure and industry trends. Key practices that CTPF has used to increase opportunities for diverse managers include the following. We have secured the commitment of our legislators, trustees and senior management. We have removed barriers. We have implemented policies. We have tracked our performance in reference to our policy goals. By establishing a process of outreach and engaging with organizations that promote diversity, like NASP, NAIC, ILPA, New American Alliance, and Accelerate Investors, just to name a few. Investors have the greatest power to affect change in the asset management industry. In the Illinois Pension Code, it is declared to be a public policy of the state of Illinois to encourage diversity and inclusion. While we take baby steps, Congress can move the needle and create opportunities for diverse managers on a much larger scale. If only to listen to my testimony, I hope that I have played a small part in expressing the importance of diversity and inclusion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Ms. Jones, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral testimony of your, te to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Thank you very much, Chairwoman Beatty. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Wagner. Thank you, Chairwoman uh, Waters. I appreciate the invitation to be here. I recognize that I submitted an enormously dense written testimony uh, with a lot of facts and figures, so I'm not even going to attempt to read that. I just would like to give you a few highlights. Um, I've been in this industry for about 20 years. I've been researching diverse asset managers for almost a decade. During that period of time, I've come to one very positive conclusion, and that conclusion is without reservation that every single person from Wall Street to Main Street is poor because we don't have more diverse asset managers in the investment management and asset management business. And I know that's a bold statement, but I want to say that because of three primary things. Number one, 
We've discussed some about the performance of diverse asset managers. Most studies that are available show that performance is either comparable to or higher than a non-diverse cohort. It doesn't matter where you look. If you look at diverse manage, asset manager outperformance, if you look at the addition of diverse asset management members to non-diverse firms, uh, you see a boost in performance. And if you look at the representation of uh, diverse firms in the top quartile, again, you see an overrepresentation. Even if you look at firms that are managed by people who grew up poor, they outperform. So what does this tell me? This tells me that every investor out there, from the wealthiest individual to the firemen, policemen, and teachers that depend on well-funded pensions to be able to ensure their retirement, are not achieving the returns that they should be achieving. Number two, we know that uh, minorities and women have a tendency to have different cognitive and behavioral preferences. These preferences lead to differentiated investment behavior, differentiated deal flow, and that can actually have pretty big impacts, again, for all investors. It can provide liquidity when markets are melting down because it's been shown, for example, that women sell into downwardly trending markets less than men. Uh, it can provide uh, differentiated returns when it comes to private equity, which is sitting on a mountain of dry powder it needs to invest, and yet uh, diverse uh, private equity managers actually tend to find different deals with lower valuations with better returns. So we could actually mitigate market bubbles and bursts, and we could actually provide additional diversification within portfolios if we had more diverse members in the industry. And then finally, because we have so few uh, diverse individuals within the asset management spectrum, we see investment not coming into certain parts of the world. If you look at venture capital, for example, two-thirds of venture capital is concentrated on the East Coast and the West Coast, and the vast majority of it is focused with white male founders. In fact, if you look at the, uh, at the amount of venture capital that goes to female founders, that's 2.2% over the course of the last two years. If you look at the percent of venture capital that went to minority founders, uh, including blacks and Latinos, over, over history, that's been about 1%. That is not acceptable. Why is that not acceptable? It's not acceptable because we are ign ignoring an enormously power powerful consumer group. Women right now control 51.3% of the investable wealth. That's going up to 66%. Blacks actually saw an increase uh, in income over the 200,000 mark of 138%. Latinos are the fastest growing economic demographic out there. So by not funding and meeting their needs, we are in dire uh, trouble of not having a robust e economy. And we're also not creating jobs in these underserved areas. Um, and so if you take all of that as truth and you believe that we're poor, then obviously we need to fix it. Um, because I think no one here wants to know that firemen, policemen, and teachers, and you yourselves may be less well off. There's a couple of different ways, I think, to address that. The primary way is education, making sure that investors know that they are missing out if they do not encourage diversity within their asset management firms. My experience is that if investors demand it, Wall Street will respond. The second thing is to educate asset managers about the benefits uh, of having diverse members uh, on their teams and then also the risks that they face if they don't, not being able to capture the assets under management, having investors choose other firms. And then finally, we have to choose to educate women and uh, people of color at a very early age. They're not getting access to education that shows them that this is a robust career opportunity for them, and they're also not getting the experience and the knowledge to be able to do that. And I think that we could make huge strides in that area. Thank you very much. Thank you. I now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Let me again just say thank you to all of you for your testimony. Uh, you gave us a lot to digest this morning. We have heard a lot from the shortage, that there is no shortage of high-performing, diverse uh, firms to from Wall Street to Main Street. We're getting poorer if we don't make a change. That, in part, is why we are here. So let me start out, and I'll start out with you, Mr. Uh, Rogers. We have heard the term, a lot of terms used today, Rooney Rule, uh, but we've also heard 
emerging managers. We've heard business diversity. And I want to thank you for sharing that with us earlier and assure you that we are now saying to all of the financial institutions, tech companies, and everyone who comes before us or meets with me that our top priority is business diversity. Tell me when you hear the term emerging manage, managers, which was once characterized uh, as a term used for women and minority-owned firms who were traditionally underrepresented in asset management. What are your thoughts? If there are, are, do you think there are any unintended consequences as a result of that term? Thank you so much for following up on uh, these important issues. Um, really, really appreciate it. I think there are a couple of unintended consequences. I think the number one, if Melody Hobson was here, she would tell you when you go to conferences on emerging managers and you talk to leaders in the industry, because the, it was always focused on the size of your firm, now 80% of emerging managers are typically white male firms. People who've left majority firms, started their own, firms and now all of a sudden they qualify under emerging. And a lot of well-meaning progressive decision makers think they have hired minority firms, and in reality they haven't. So I think that's the number one concern. The second concern is that you know when I started in 1983, people always said you need to get to size, develop a performance track record and we'll hire you. Now what's happened is once you got over the magical two or three billion dollars in a lot of states, people said now you're too big. We're looking for the next John Rogers. We don't want to hire you. And I think that's been a problem in our industry is whenever we get to that two or three billion dollars, people stop being interested. And I think it's a reason so many small minority firms, they got toward that level, actually never get above it and then fall apart and actually close because of that issue. So I think that is very critical. And um, we have to make sure that we understand that to be successful, we said these big firms have trillions of dollars under management. We can't compete unless we get to 20 billion, 30 billion, 40 billion, where we can hire the best people, have the best compliance officers, the best technology officers to really be able to be on the even playing field. So that's another big unintended consequence of, of emerging. Thank you. The next question is for you, Mr. Martinez, and you, Ms. Chia. Empirical research found that fund managed by diverse owned firms were actually overrepresented in the top performing quartile of mutual funds, hedge funds, and private equity. And yet consultants are sometimes seen as the gatekeepers for assets, are often biased against diverse owned firms because they have all these preconceived notions. Tell me your thoughts on are consultants providing equitable access in this field or not? So uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I think um, that there is this incredible power to incumbency. Um, consultants um, favor the firms they know extremely well and that they have extremely long relationships with. Um, and as a result, it is incumbent on us as customers to be able to say to a consultant, we care about um, uh, diversity. I'm gonna rush you only because I have 39 seconds so, and I yep. want her to also answer. Yes. And, and you can also answer in short answers like yes or no. Uh, so I agree with Mr. Martinez on the um, importance of incumbency. Most consultants, when they do a new fund, 70% go to current um, investment managers. But I would also like to add you know, the um, personal risk uh, of making a decision with an unknown manager. There is uh, you know, bias against, um, you know, voting against yourself. Okay, thank you. I only have you know. eight seconds. Would you all support a version of a Rooney rule? And that's a yes or a no. Mr. Martinez? Yes. Ms. Jones? Uh, yes. Ms. Miller May? Yes. Ms. Chia? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Thank you. It is now... It is now my honor to yield a minute and a half to the Honorable Chairwoman of the Financial Services Committee, Congresswoman Maxine Waters. Thank you, Congresswoman Beatty, uh, for all of the work that you're doing dealing with this issue. And I thank all of our witnesses who are here today. Um, I want you to know 
that I established this subcommittee of the Financial Services Committee uh, because it's time for members of Congress to get serious about diversity and inclusion. I've been working on this for 30 years now. Started in California with the uh, pension funds there, and we uh, were able to get started in that time with the emerging managers, uh, as you have described. And I understand the limitations with that. But it is extremely important that we open up these avenues for involvement, because I saw what it was able to do with individuals like Victor McFarland, uh, who was one of the beneficiaries of uh, the Emerging Fund, and also Mr. Mark Cazenave, and all of those that were came forward uh, back in 1990, whatever, 91, when we got involved. And I also, I've seen uh, when we have comptrollers around the country, like you had in New York, uh, at one point uh, that was able to open up these opportunities. And so establishing this subcommittee gives focus uh, to this issue. And now all that we need is a commitment from the Congress of the United States, the members of Congress, to do the right thing. And so we're going to move forward very aggressively, and we're not going to uh, act in some of the ways that we have acted since uh, I've been here in Congress, where we get turned down when we've had some meetings by those who should be opening up opportunities, and we let it go. It won't be that anymore. So I thank you for being here today. We're on it. Uh, we're going to be aggressive. We're going to be persistent. And I thank all of those who have been struggling and who have been helping out with this issue for so many years. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much to our chair. Now I have the distinct honor of going to our ranking member and my good friend, the distinguished ranking member, Ann Wagner, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and uh, thank you all for your testimony and presence here today. Like all asset managers, minority and uh, women-owned asset managers deserve an equal opportunity to manage funds for institutional investors. Firms should not be disadvantaged uh, due to the, the composi uh, composition of their ownership. Ms. Jones, from your work in this area, what are some of the most effective ways to remove obstacles for diverse asset managers and increase their access to funds? You may want to also finish your, um, uh, your answer to uh, the, the, the chairwoman's uh, uh, previous question. I think I can incorporate that into my answer. So I, I look at this as being a three-pronged process. I don't think that because this is a complicated issue, I don't see that there is a simple solution, unfortunately. Um, so the way that I look at it, we really have to consider three different avenues of, of uh, solution here. The first being education, as I mentioned. Uh, we've got to educate investors about what they're missing, missing out on. We have to educate uh, asset managers on how to do a better job with diversity and inclusion and what they may be missing out on. And then we really have to educate girls and people of color at an early age so that we have an effective pipeline. Uh, I'm a member of the board of directors for a nonprofit called Rock the Street Wall Street. We provide year-long financial and investment literacy education to high school girls. 97% of them have a higher understanding of, uh, a better understanding of asset management and investment by the time they're done. 67% say that they would actually opt into an asset management uh, major or minor going forward. So that's pretty huge, and, and we cover 69% of our, of our girls are, are people of color, so we're trying to, to build the pipeline. So that's number one. Number two, we have to engage, and part of that engagement is uh, encouraging firms to disclose things like their transparency, st uh, their diversity statistics. Um, if that way, consumers can make an informed decision about which firms offer the best chance at getting cognitive and behavioral alpha. So it also allows us to be able to track progress. The third thing would be, I think, mandates. Um, and that's where the Rooney Rule comes in. So without, the Rooney, without those first two, then we risk not having a great pipeline. And we also risk a fair amount of gamesmanship when it comes to uh, people trying to take advantage of these types of, of mandates. I've seen this happen already, where people who are, uh, where firms are giving ownership 
to diverse individuals in order to just qualify for these mandates, but it doesn't create long-term change. It doesn't help build the next generation. So I think we need the, the full enchilada in order to be successful. Well, and in fact, I will say, Ms. Jones, we've had, um, we've had panelists and witnesses that have talked about uh, how important it is uh, not just for the candidates that are being interviewed, but for the interviewers and those that are making those decisions um, to also uh, uh, be people of, of, of color and women and uh, a more diverse panel. Asset management is a $74 trillion industry and it continues to grow every year. But the diversity of asset managers in the industry has obviously remained low, both in terms of number of diverse owned firms and funds, as well as the number of assets under management. Ms. Jones, what are some of the ways to increase the number of women and minorities um, in this industry, uh, if you want to elaborate some more? Yeah, so I think that one of the important things we have to remember is it's not just the ownership that's the problem, it's the actual participants in the industry. If you look, for example, at uh, private equity, only 11.7% of uh, private equity executives are women. If you look at venture capital, uh, only about 8% of investment professionals in venture capital are women. 82% of venture capital firms don't have a single uh, black partner, uh, investment partner with them. And so these are, these are where the next generation of fund managers come from. This is where the next generation of people of color and women who are going to own a business come from. So we actually have to address that problem too. And, and I know that you've done a, a great deal of work in, my work in my limited time here related to increasing the participation among women and minorities in the STEM programs. And it's something that I also uh, talk about a great deal. How can we increase the number of women and minorities who are enrolling in STEM courses and other programs that could lead to a career in asset management? It's not just true of financial services, it's across Correct. the board. Um, business courses have re remained low in terms of their enrollments. I know you may not have time yeah, to answer, we, we but... we have to start much earlier than we think. Unfortunately, right now, most of the intervention is focused around college and MBA right. level. We have to start earlier. People start opting out at age 11. So unless we can get public-private partnerships to intervene and provide education and inspiration for women and people of color at that stage, then a lot of people have already opted out. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from North Carolina, Ms. Adams, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Beatty, and thank you for convening this uh, timely hearing. To, and to all the witnesses, thank you very much for being here today to discuss the importance of diversifying our asset managers. Uh, we've said it time and time again here in this committee and in the larger uh, committee, uh, making an investment in diversity and inclusion is not only the right thing or the moral thing to do, the data shows us it makes good business sense. Um, organizations make smarter decisions, they function more effect effectively, and they experience uh, increased productivity and greater profitability, but yet minorities and women continue to be underrepresented. So let me begin my questioning by um, uh, indicating that, you know, investors do rely on the advice from investment consultant firms about which uh, management firms are best qualified to manage the investments. But if the investment consultant firms are biased against diverse owned firms because they've preconceived notions that they are too small or, or, or risky, they may not be getting the same opportunities as other firms. So Mr. Rogers and Ms. Chia, what challenges have you faced as a uh, diverse asset manager and being, being contacted by or getting meetings with investment consultants about managing funds? Over the 36 years, uh, we've had varying results with different consultants. There are some extraordinarily open consultants that want to work with diverse firms who believe in it. Uh, early in our career, we wouldn't have been able to make it to the next level without those types of consultants. And I know at the Knight Foundation, a lot of their work, they've worked very carefully with their consultant, Cambridge Associates, to be able to get the job done. Um, at the same time, there are a lot of consultants that, as I came along, had never had an African-American professional or a woman in a leadership role in their organizations. They weren't used to interacting with people of color and diverse communities. And so then, of course, when they were being pushed by their clients to do it, they got resistant. Mm -hmm. Because as we all know in this country, there is a lot of anti-affirmative action sentiment, you know, and, it, and, it, and it's, it shows up in lots of different ways, whether it's through college admissions to, again, the business world. And so I think that's a real challenge. Okay. The way to overcome that is you have to have the customer has to demand that the consultant 
live up to the values of the institution that's hired them. Okay, great, Ms. Chief. I'll second that. Um, and we've seen Southern State Pension Funds be the real leaders in this area. And AIM would like to see more pension funds and more endowments and foundations step up. And um, as Mr. Rogers said, you know, deliver on the values of not just the institutional investors, but the pensioners they serve. We want to reflect that um, in the investment mandates. Okay, thanks very much. Ms. Miller May, what more could diverse asset managers do to make themselves more competitive as well as to build relationships and confidence with fund investment officers? So uh, diverse managers um, can, I tell diverse managers the RFP should not be the first time that I'm meeting you. They need to build relationships way before we get to the point where we're searching for managers. Um, it is, you know, paramount that we know who we're investing with, um, we understand their track record, we understand how they invest, how they source deals, um, how they execute deals. Um, we have what we call a First Friday where we see managers every First Friday of the month and we have them present to us so that when we do a search, we, we know, you know the managers that are out there, the universe of managers. Okay. We're a trustee-led uh, firm and a, um, a, a staff-led firm, not a consultant-led right. firm. Thanks very much. Uh, Ms. Martinez, uh, your research, or Mr. Martinez, excuse me, your research indicates that funds managed by diverse owned firms were overrepresented in the top performing quartile of mutual funds, hedge funds, and private equity. Uh, despite being underrepresented in asset under management for each asset class. So what do you conclude about the notion that diverse asset managers perform poorly? So it, that's certainly false. There are managers that perform well. There are managers that perform poorly. That is across all the gender and racial uh, sectors. Okay, let me ask a yes or no question to everyone. Should companies be required to share their diversity data, including their use of diverse asset managers? Uh, we had Chairwoman Waters and Chair Beatty who sent requests. Uh, we didn't get what we thought we'd get, so can you just tell me yes or no? Should they be required to share their diversity data? Yes, I believe okay. so. Yes. 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 All right, thank you very much. Madam Chair, I yield back. The lady yields back. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Stile, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, and thank you for holding today's hearing as to how we can further uh, diversity and inclusion on what is an, a very important topic. Um, in particular, we, need, we know that women and minority-owned uh, firms should not be uh, disadvantaged. Uh, but I want to I look is to, to the discussion about what kind of burdens we're placing uh, out there a little bit. Uh, and uh, Ms. Miller May, I uh, want to ask you a question. As you know, my, my district sits on the, the Illinois-Wisconsin border. Uh, and as I look south, we see some real struggling uh, with pensions uh, kind of across the board. And so we naturally watch uh, what happens very likely out of the 66,000 members. Some of them uh, would live north uh, in my district, which is part of the census-designated Chicago uh, metro area uh, in some areas. Could you note what the, the actuarial accrued liability of your pension fund would be off of the 2018 uh, annual report? It's 7 percent. Uh, well, it, 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 I'd like unanimous consent to, to submit the, the Chicago Teachers Pension Fund uh, 2018 con Comprehensive Annual Report uh, to the record. Because uh, in there you'll note that the actuarially accrued liability of the pension fund is $22.9 billion <laughs> as of J June 30th, 2018, which was an increase of $1.1 billion uh, from the previous year. And so of that amount, do you know how much of the accrued liability uh, is underfunded? We are 49% um, funded, so we are, we're just at 51%. It's about, about $12 billion, about $12 billion right. uh, underfunded with total assets in the fund in the neighborhood of $10.7 billion as of the last uh, annual uh, report. And if we look at what those rates of return are for 2018, uh, the five-year uh, rate of return, do you know what that was? Oh, for 2018? Uh, uh, 9%. 9%. Yes. And so 9% 9, 9 for 2018, 8.8 .8, uh, over the last five years, which is roughly in line with the S&P uh, 500, depending on exactly how you calculate that out, and you guys are balancing things out, not purely um, in equities. 
But if you look at the unfunded liability that's going to increase, uh, as noted in the report, it will continually increase through 2039. Uh, and it will never be fully am am amortized. It'll never be fully amortized under their current structure, which means that eventually these liabilities are going to be held uh, by taxpayers in Chicago and in the state of Illinois. And so do you know what percentage of your assets are held in U.S. equities? Uh, right now, 30%. So, right, so, tw so 20, 29%, and if you looked at total uh, equities across the board, including in the foreign, it's about 59%, 60 percent. And so as I look at some of the proposals that we have in front of us from a, from a legislative perspective to continue to put burdens on publicly traded U.S. equities, and we've seen this kind of across the board, not only from this committee, but kind of this growing trend across the board to continually put burdens and reporting restrictions specifically on U.S. publicly traded equities, which is exactly what your pension beneficiaries are relying on, which is currently underfunded by about 50 percent. And so out of your 66,000 members, they need to see that growth. And we've seen this trend in Congress to continue to put burdens on publicly traded companies for reporting requirements and other requirements. And I get concerned about the overall fund's investment performance and how we're going to have U.S. publicly traded companies performing in the United States against the burden that we're placing them uh, on the SEC. And pension beneficiaries uh, and retirees are reliant upon these returns, uh, and their futures depend on it. And so I couldn't speak more to the importance of making sure that we are not allowing women and minority-owned firms and in any way, shape, or form to be disadvantaged. But as we look at the policy solutions to address that, I think we have to be cognizant of the burdens that we continually put from a reporting perspective on publicly traded companies for the SEC to manage uh, and look for my colleagues uh, across the aisle and on this side to continually be cognizant of the fact that we continually place burdens or proposed burdens in this case on the SEC for reporting requirements which continually build and the impact that that's having on pension funds in the United States, on retirees' assets in the United States uh, I think that's just terribly, terribly important. So I appreciate uh, the time, and I yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The gentlewoman from Pennsylvania, Ms. Dean, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, I thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm delighted that you're holding this uh, subcommittee hearing today. I, just recently, about a week ago, in my office, we had a hearing on diversity and inclusion uh, among business leaders, government leaders, people in law, uh, and it was a very stunningly striking similar conversation uh, from Mr. Martinez where you, you actually decided that you thought you were doing well in terms of diversity, but when you looked around, you weren't. Uh, that was one of the recognitions among the people, the leaders that were in my, my office, who said we actually look at our organization, thought we were doing well with diversity, and we're just not. Uh, the other thing that I noticed uh, each of you said was to be intentional, uh, to be deliberate, that if you recognize you've got a problem, you've got to deliberately do something about it. I'll start with you, Mr. Rogers. I was particularly struck by your testimony. You very quickly ticked through three of the areas that, are, that uh, compound or are part of the problem, that notion of sort of birds of a feather flock together. Uh, we seem to just gather with the same type of folks. And, and so one of my questions is, how do we break through that? Uh, I think one of the answers is going to be education, as Ms. Jones will say. Um, the second one I thought was very interesting. Um, there's an implicit and unconscious bias. Again, how do we break through that against uh, African-American-owned, minority-owned, or women-owned uh, money managers? Um, but one that I really want you to take a look at is um, the, the third notion, you say that many banks, corporations, and nonprofits have embraced well-intentioned supplier diversity programs, uh, and that maybe gives us a skewed picture of diversity. Could you just speak to that third aspect first, Mr. Rogers? I was trying to talk, put both of them together. A uh, quick story, when I was uh, president of the Chicago Park District 25 years ago, uh, there are nine museums on parkland, and so I was ex officio on all those boards. And I said to those folks that we wanted to be uh, living the values of the city of Chicago and that the museums on parkland should be using minority-owned firms, the same way the city of Chicago was doing it, under the leadership of Rich Daly and before that, Harold Washington. And what they did is they came up with an idea of a symposium. 
And the symposium uh, was a one day we brought minority vendors together with the decision makers from the museums. And they ended up with an invitation that was a man in a hard hat with a shovel and the tagline was digging up business. So they, when they thought of minority business leaders, they thought of us as people with a shovel with a hard hat. Those are very honorable possession, uh, fields, those are very, very important. But they didn't think about us being their lawyer, their accountant, their money manager, their asset manager, their investment banker, right. where again, the profit margins are so, are so high in today, yeah. and it's such an important part of today's economy. So it ties together this implicit bias, unconscious bias, to this idea that we have looked at supplier diversity, which needs to be changed because it really is 40 years out of date. The economy has moved to a financial services, professional services, and technology-based economy, so we have to move with it if we want all of us to be included in our economy. Okay. Mr. Martinez, would, if you would go back on what you were talking about in terms of recognizing there was a problem and then, then you uh, began this study. What are some of the other things that you learned as a result of, of your study? So uh, one of the things to this idea of data and, and capturing data is how difficult it is to actually be able to do these studies and, how diff and, and what that implies for governance. So to be intentional is partly to uh, hold people accountable, to get data on a regular basis and look at the portfolio and, and, what, and, and how that occurs. Uh, to the point of performance, when you combine the issue of uh, sort of smaller sizes of funds but overrepresentation of performance, our um, belief is that there is overperformance. There is uh, alpha, as we would say in the investment field, being left on the table. Uh, because you have managers who could be outperforming at a much with greater assets and generating greater returns who are not getting access to that. Okay. And finally, on the issue of education, and maybe I'll go to you, Ms. Jones. Uh, I represent suburban Philadelphia, Montgomery and Berks counties. Uh, it's a robust, um, diverse area. Uh, but the thing I try to connect uh, my school districts to are people like you. So I love the idea that you're talking to young people, particularly young girls, um, and opening their eyes to other opportunities. Uh, I invite you to come to my district. Uh, what are some of the ways that you actually, can you sort of describe to us that educational program? So the educational program uh, that I work with is both formal and informal. So we have a year-long educational program that goes into high schools uh, for, for one year. The first uh, part of the semester is based on classroom learning. The second part is on mentoring and having interactions. We start out with very basic financial concepts like budgeting and things like that, making sure that people understand money, uh, which because a lot of our students are disadvantaged and in disadvantaged areas, they may not. Um, and then we move on uh, to more advanced co uh, concepts. So if a school stays in the program for a long time, uh, so let's say a girl goes to the program for four years, they could learn about things like how to trade options by the fourth year which means that they can go into any kind of economics or finance program they want to uh, in college or in graduate school. But it's also important- The gentle's lady's time has expired. Sorry, your time has expired. Uh, I, again, I invite you to come help me and my, my young people. Thank you. Thank you. The gentle woman from Texas, Ms. Garcia, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you again, as others have said, for bringing attention to this very critical issue, I think. Uh, we won't um, be where we need to be unless we have true economic power, and it certainly uh, uh, comes from not only the dollars that, that we earn, but the dollars that are invested. So thank you for, for, um, for putting this together, and thank you to all the panelists. So this has been a concern of mine for, for many years. As, as some of you may know, I was the elected city controller in Houston um, back in the 90s and a couple of prior lives before uh, this one. And uh, I always made it a, a point to make sure that that, that our office uh, included in not only in the, the bond issues that we did, but also in the investment portfolio to ensure that a minority and, and women-owned businesses uh, got, got included and fully included and participated. So I, I think that, that we can't wait for more states uh, to act like Illinois and others. Uh, we must do something here. Um, and and I, Mr. Rogers, I was really struck with the example you just gave about your museum work uh, and by your characterization of, of calling some of this a modern Jim Crow. 
if you could think of like the one single thing that we could really act on to change that, to ensure that there was no Jim Crow and that there was no even remnants of Jim Crow, I mean, what would it be? And if you would, please, because of time, could you just keep it simple? Uh, and then I want everybody else to, to, to answer the same question. I mean, like the one thing we need to do. Um, I know Bill Von Haney from Exelon has testified here recently, and what Exelon does better than anyone is they keep track of all of the spending by category. So if you have transparency and you can see how much of the advertising dollars are going to minority firms, how much of the investment firms, or how much of the construction contracts, if everything is exposed and everything is transparent, right meaning people will start to give opportunities to people in all aspects of the spend. So that's what's key is that transparency and keeping track of every category, not the total amount, which sometimes obscures what's really happening underneath. Okay, Ms. Ms. Chigan. Um, I would like Congress to lead by example, um, to mandate funds under federal management to subject to regular and periodic open competition. Right, you said earlier you're for the yes. re rules. Okay, and Ms. May, Miller May, and, and again, thank you for the good work in, in Illinois. Thank you. I think the, the first thing is to set policies, um, to systematically remove barriers, and to track and measure your, your goals and how you're performing against those and to improve on that. I'm assuming you mean that that needs to be transparent. Yes. Yeah, all right, and Ms. Jones? Well, in addition to education, I think the number one thing we can do is if we do accept my premise that this is valuable information for investors to have in order to be able to maximize returns and diversification, that we have to make it where uh, firms are transparent and they provide this non-financial data as another decision-making point for anyone who's looking to make an investment. Okay, Mr. Martinez. So in addition to, trans to all these great points, I, I think that from a customer's perspective, we have to encourage each other as customers and hold ourselves accountable to making sure that we are asking this question and asking the question specifically. So, for example, in the question of diversity, uh, it's not enough to ask diversity, if you're talking to an asset manager, what's the diversity percentage of your firm? It's what's the diversity within your investment operations uh, right. to better understand how they're building their pipeline. Right, and, and what, what can we be doing in the private sector? But you're in a private foundation, and again, I applaud you, and I know that my colleague has already mentioned to me you basically decided you weren't doing enough and you needed to take action. I mean, what can we do to get other private foundations and private industry to, to see the light as you have seen? I, I, I do think that there is a, uh, it, so some of it is a little educational. I think there's a misconception that comes from this idea of, uh, of um, uh, concessionary performance or underperformance, a belief that that exists, that it somehow would violate a trustee's fiduciary responsibility to continue to ask uh, for diversity. I think to the extent that we um, hold ourselves accountable to understand and educate ourselves that there is underperform or there's overperformance to be had, uh, and then be transparent in our own data with each other, uh, that, is a, that would go a long way. Thank you, and uh, Madam Chair, you back. Thank you. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Lawson, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, uh, and, and welcome uh, to the committee. Uh, uh, Minority-owned uh, firms uh, are often unable to meet what some of you all uh, dictate as the minimum requirement to set up institutional investors, such as size, asset, and, and experience. Uh, length of uh, track record. How can we level the playing field to ensure uh, that minority-owned firms are able to meet the mental requirement? I say that because it, it might have been Ms. Miller, uh, could have been Ms. Jones stated that uh, a lot of these access, manager, access managers who uh, maybe start off on Wall Street for a while and then they leave and start their own firms, you know, uh, then they, they still had a little bit more advantage uh, in the marketplace than minority and women's who were not able to do that. So from the standpoint, uh, how do you level the playing field uh, so that uh, 
uh, you can bring more people of diversity uh, in and to this area. And, and, and every one of you can take a shot at it if you like. Starting out with Mr. Martinez. Thank you very much. I, I think the kind of twofold. One is a long-term and the other one is a short-term answer. I think on the, in the long-term, it's certainly um, asking um, asset managers to establish large institutional asset managers to increase uh, their diversity within their investment operations to build that pipeline. But secondly, the question is from a, from a customer perspective, as an asset allocator, uh, how do we set our size guidelines? So if I say, for example, I can only write a $100 million check to a firm, then that excludes everybody beneath a certain size. Uh, the question would be, can I be on the ground floor or can I, be, uh, can I help a, a, a quality manager um, grow by writing a smaller check and then increasing that over time as I build the relationship? So it's, it's judging our own internal criteria. And then I would um, follow up on the comments I think Mrs. Jones made and others that one of the key things that you know, Maynard Jackson did extraordinarily well when he was mayor of Atlanta and other political leaders of that generation, they insisted that all the financial services firms that did business in that city had to look like that city. And those leaders that became managing directors and partners in those investment banks from that generation ultimately were the ones that started the next generation of big companies, the Loop Capitals, the Williams Capitals, the firms like that. It came from that kind of initiative. So I think we've got to get our local political leaders to make sure that the investment firms that do business in their cities look like their cities and otherwise not do business with them. The second thing is we have to get the financial services companies and local communities to partner with urban public schools. You know, that's what we've done with our Aerial Community Academy, teaching financial literacy to these young people. But it's not only important that they're learning about the stock market and investing, but they're starting to see role models that look like themselves who are in the financial services industry. And so we need to encourage that to happen more and more in this country, and hopefully we'll be able to inspire people to make a difference. Okay, Ms. Chan. So organizations like AIM, NAIC, NAA make it very easy for institu institutional investors and asset owners to come and meet diverse managers. That's what we are built for. And for any one of these asset owners seeking uh, managers, they can come to us or come to our events and meet extremely well-qualified, highly educated managers. So in Illinois, we uh, search for managers through a request for proposals. Cl uh, staff has taken the ownership of uh, or writing the language that's in those RFPs. So we will uh, write specifically for minority women and disabled managers that we are searching for a minority or a diverse firm. Um, we will lower the AUM that they need. We will shorten that track record we will size that mandate specifically so that it's open for all diverse managers to present. And then we ensure that any qualified minority manager is uh, a finalist for that search. Okay, Ms. Jones, I have about 27 seconds. Um, so one of the things I think is very real and that Juan mentioned is that there are some structural barriers for people uh, investing in some of the smaller funds. An investment policy statement in many cases states that you cannot be more than X percent of a fund's assets under management. There have been a number of uh, endeavors where people have tried to go out and create an aggregation system. So you aggregate the assets of these smaller diverse managers to make it easier for people to invest. Those have not yet been successful. So anyone who's able to actually facilitate that will go a long way in helping these smaller managers reach critical mass. I yield back, Ms. Madam Chair. Thank you. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Housing, Community Development, and Insurance, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Beatty. And let me also thank the panel for your participation in this hearing today. And go, uh, along the same lines of questioning as my friend from Florida, what I ask about in um, how investors rely on advice from investment consulting firms about which assets management firms are best qualified to manage their investments. But if investment consulting firms are biased against diverse owned firms because 
they have preconceived notions that they are too small or riskier. They may not be getting the same opportunities as other firms despite their documented high performance. Um, Mr. Rogers and Ms. Chia, uh, what challenges have you faced as a, a, a diverse asset manager and being contacted by or getting meetings with investment consultants about managing funds? Let's start with Ms. Chia. Thank you for that question. Our observation of AIM is that um, incumbency is a huge issue. When consultants do searches, they tend to go with the people they know. But there's also the factor of career risk. A consultant um, is probably safer by recommending a known manager versus someone who's newer and less established. So that's been our observation. And we've encouraged consultants to come to our events at AIM and to meet extremely diverse and well-qualified managers. We have over 3,000 institutional investors and managers in our network. And, and Mr. Rogers, how do you overcome that and, and persevere? Uh, yeah. go, go right ahead and, and answer the question. Well, it's, it's a challenge, but the way you, first and foremost, is performance. Uh, we have lots of diverse firms that have extraordinary performance, and the data is there. That's one of the great things about being in this industry people can see your performance, and that overcomes the biases often that are there. But it is a challenge. As I said earlier, there is still is such an anti-affirmative action uh, feeling in this country in a lot of different parts of our communities. You know, when somebody whose kid didn't get into the school they thought they should have, and they think that a minority kid took their kid's place, or someone got a promotion that they thought they should have gotten, and it's because they were diverse, that falter filters into the way they view us. And so it's a challenge. And the final thing is that the senior people in these firms often are going to be most interested in being supportive, the CEOs and the chairman of these firms, but the decision makers are the 30-year-olds who are further and further away from the civil rights movement, who didn't see the sacrifices of the Dr. Kings and the John Lewis's and the others. And so they're less interested and less sympathetic to seeing diversity and inclusion in all aspects of our economy, and that's a challenge. And, and along those same lines, how do you get more young people of African descent interested in pursuing careers in investment management and private equity venture capital in the industry as a whole? Well, there's two things, you know, one is that what we've tried to do, we talked about this earlier, that the Aerial Community Academy teaching kids starting in kindergarten through eighth grade about the stock market and giving them real money to invest and they watch that money grow over eight years uh, we take them to annual meetings to meet CEOs and other leaders, like when Don Thompson was the CEO of McDonald's, so they see people of color in leadership roles and start to think about being CEO and being in these uh, top levels of the financial services industry. And that's important. The other thing we've done at the University of Chicago, we've created a program for minority students to work in the investment offices of major endowments throughout the United States. And we think that's a great place to start because if you're in an, in an endowment office, you're going to be able to learn about venture capital, private equity, and hedge funds. Uh, we've had several kids at the Knight Foundation. I know it's gone very, very well. And you, you, you bring up Chicago. I represent St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, any, any positive experiences from anyone on the panel in the area of diversity would say the city of St. Louis or the state of Missouri? And anyone can go at that. Only one challenge that I've faced there is we think that the universities in this country can be doing work with minority-owned asset managers. They all have multi-billion dollar endowments, and most of them have never spent a dollar with a minority firm in the history of their institutions, even if they've hired 100 or more money managers. It kind of looks like baseball in 1940. So I remember going to see Wash U and finding they had no interest in working with diverse firms. That's a very good point you raised. I will certainly bring it to their attention. Thank you, and I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Gonzalez, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, for hosting this hearing today, and, and thank you to our witnesses for your participation. Uh, prior to this hearing, I reviewed the 2017 GAO report that has been mentioned a few times uh, throughout the hearing. I was struck by the finding that there was a bias within institutional inve investors and their consultants. There was a bias against minority and women-owned firms 
to even be included in the asset manager searches due to bias that their portfolio's performance could suffer. This is, of course, not substantiated in any data or recent studies. Uh, Ms. Jones, in your view, what can be done to educate the industry about the incorrect biases towards the performance of women or minority-owned asset managers? Um, well, number one, I think that we have to make sure that uh, all of the information is presented in a clear and cogent and quick manner. Um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of uh, institutional investors and consultants are bombarded with information all the time. Uh, and so making sure that they have uh, this information at their fingertips is critical. The other thing is that they really need to be exposed to these managers, have conversations with these managers. I think when I talk to a lot of diverse managers, they lament the fact that they are unable to get a meeting uh, with some institutional investors and consultants. And frankly, if you can't get the meeting, then it's really hard to educate someone about what type of niche investment, what type of specialized skill, what type of cognitive or behavioral alpha that you may have. So I think that, uh, that those two things go quite a long way in trying to break down some of those barriers. You know, the other thing I think we have to do is make sure that people understand uh, this, is, this is kind of a corollary to no one gets fired for buying IBM. Uh, it seems much safer to mm. invest with a firm that uh, lots of other people are invested with. Um, but obviously, there can be lack of reward in that, too, because if, if you, everyone invests with the same people, then everyone gets the same undifferentiated return. Um, and so I think trying to uh, help people overcome those types of biases uh, would also be helpful. Great. Does anybody else on the panel want to comment on that specific issue? Ms. Miller, seems like you. I think that uh, there should be checks and balances. We're hiring the consultants, and therefore, they work for us. Um, we should have, and we do have staff that validates or you know challenges the consultants on what they're bringing to us. We do our homework in staff in in house to to let them know that you know these are the managers that we're looking at, and we challenge their diversity. They report to us on an annual basis their diversity, which managers um, are contributing to them as a firm. Um, and some of the fees that they're getting. So it's, it's about holding them accountable as well. Great. Uh, anyone else? Mr. Martinez? Well, I, I will say one thing that has worked and I think is important for Knight, Knight Foundation has been um, asking ourselves what level of diversity in, is involved in the, in the portfolio and in the, in the management side, and then being transparent about it um, to the field. So if you were to go on our website, for example, we have in aggregate the dollars uh, that we have under management by diverse owned firms. So encouraging that level of transparency, even if it's not at the individual manager, which we do as well, but at a, at a minimum at, on the aggregate, I think creates a, a, um, an atmosphere where it's more acceptable. Thank you. And then, um, so I don't mean to kind of typify, but when I think of like the hedge fund world and the, uh, the average hedge fund manager, right? It's a it's sort of a specific pipeline, uh, more or less. It's Ivy League or equivalent, a couple years in investment banking, uh, an MBA from a top tier school, and then going into the hedge fund world. I think that's, you know, that probably is, I don't know, 60%, 70%. Um, how do we, as a committee or, or as, a, as a country, encourage more folks from diverse backgrounds to enter into the pipeline at the earliest stages and then make sure that we're fostering an environment that allows them to, to progress through that kind of system, if you will, um, throughout their careers. Sure. Um, so a, a wise man uh, named John Rogers uh, once told me um, that if a young person does not see someone that they can identify with yep. in those spaces, then to them, even though the statistics may bore out that, wow, that, that's an achievable goal, it becomes an impenetrable barrier. And so the question is, like, as, cus as customers, do we ask and demand our uh, asset managers to show diversity within the, the investment operations? And I think that's vital. Great. Mr. Rogers, do you have anything? To the only thing I would add quickly is at the end of the day, I think universities can start to do a better job of tracking how their graduates are doing at these big financial services firms, how many are becoming managing directors and partners. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of our witnesses for their testimony. And I'd especially like to thank Ms. Jones and Mr. Rogers for repeatedly talking about education. 
And it is my honor, speaking of education, to recognize in the audience Mr. Stephen Miller with the United Negro College Fund and is the Area Director of Development, I'm proud to say, from my great district in the great state of Ohio. Thank you, and hopefully you can feed in to that pipeline. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the committee, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond promptly as you are able. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the committee for inclusion in the record. This hearing is adjourned.